And I believe God is honoring that, and he is faithful to answer our prayers as we remain faithful and stand in the gap. So the scripture I had chosen for today is Hosea 2, 6 through 7. And it says, and this is a prayer to pray for your prodigal. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up their way with thorns. Now, are many of our prodigals out seeking this path and another path, trying to find security, trying to find happiness? They're looking to materialism. They're looking to status. They're looking to money, all kinds of things, to fulfill the void that's in their heart. Pray that God will hedge their way up with thorns, and everything that they're seeking, they will run into a thorny wall, and they will not be able to find any satisfaction and he says, I want to make a wall that she will not be able to find her path. It goes on to say, she's going to follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. Now, she's going to seek them, and we have many that are seeking the philosophy of New Age. They have gotten into New Age. Mysticism is reviving. It is becoming prevalent in our society. They are seeking them, but God, we pray that they will not find any satisfaction in anything that they are pursuing. And then she will say, you know what? There's no satisfaction out here. I'm going to go back and return to my first husband. For then it was better with me than it was now. I immediately thought of the church at, Revelation, uh, at Ephesus in the book of Revelation. And what did he say to them? Return. Return to your first love and return to your first works so I have prayed for my prodigal many of you know that Laura was a prodigal uh, mostly since she was about 16 years old and uh, she just turned 36 last week and she's been home two years so much of that time has been a pretty dark valley for our family so pray for your prodigals that God will protect him from the wrong friends that he will protect them from wrong influences in their life and the wrong spirits that are out there trying to seduce them and leading them astray. And I love this part in Hosea 2.14. He goes on to say, Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I'm going to lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. One thing Laura will tell you, although she began making some positive steps two years before she ever came home, God was very patient. He was very gentle and loving with her, leading her one step at a time until he finally said, you need to leave everything you've got and come back to me. And then in verse 14 and 15, he says, I'm going to return her vineyards to her, and I'm going to transform that valley of trouble, that valley of depression, that valley of darkness. And he says, I'm going to transform it into a gateway of hope. And that's exactly what he's done in this prodigal's life, and we have seen it in other prodigals, and we continue to pray that for all the prodigals that are here in this box. She will give herself to me there, as she did long ago when she was young. And I immediately thought of my oldest daughter, who is a prodigal, all wrapped up in new age. But I still remember the night when she was about five or six years old, she came down the hallway and woke me up after midnight. And tears in her, running down her cheeks, and she said, Mommy, I cannot wait. I have to ask Jesus in my heart tonight. And I long for the day when she returns to that childlike faith, wanting Jesus again. So that's what we're praying for our prodigals. And I'm praying, I used to pray even for Laura. Laura, uh, Father, I just pray that all these prodigals will find themselves in the pig pen. They are at the end of themselves. And they realize nothing I have done is satisfying and I must return home and where is our father he's right there waiting patiently lovingly ready to receive them again his mercies are new every morning 
He is faithful. And I think of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. He forgives all my iniquities. He heals our diseases. And listen to this one. He redeems my life from destruction. And then what does he do? He crowns me with loving kindnesses and his tender mercies. Pray with me. Father, we just thank you for this group that is gathered, and we thank you for the privilege of bringing these uh, prodigals before you. We know that it is your will that none should perish, but yet we know there are many who have walked away from their faith. And Lord, we just lay them at the cross, and Lord, I ask that you would work and stir in their hearts as we remain as intercessors and stand in the gap. And Lord, we praise you for working in them, and we know that we will see them, every one, be prayed out of this box as you work in them. And we give you all the praise and thank you in advance for more that we will see and hear of. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. For those of you that don't know Laura, this is my youngest daughter. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You can advance if you want a little. Advice. Okay. Um, uh, before I um, before I get into my childhood and kind of the background of my testimony, I actually wanted to read um, something I've written that was about a very pivotal event. Um, because my mom and I's uh, stories are so interwoven, and uh, not only has God done a miraculous work in me over these last few years, um, but he used all the trouble that I was going through to really change my mom. And this was, so we're going to, I'm going to read this, and then we'll uh, flash back um, to earlier years. Um, but here we go again. I, I sighed begrudgingly as I opened the door to a familiar local restaurant, once again having to face my parents that I'd been hiding dark secrets from for years. So far, I'd been quite successful in covering my lies, but would it ever catch up to me? I'm not sure I cared. The truth was, I wasn't afraid to lose their love. Their constant perusing into my business was like a wet blanket on the, judge, in, on the indulgent life I was enjoying away from their judgmental eyes. But to keep the peace, here I was joining them for dinner on a Saturday night instead of spending the evening with my new love interest. It was becoming increasingly difficult, however, to hide the more recent lifestyle changes. For years, I had been concealing a multitude of acts that would have horrified them, but now the changes were undeniable. About eight months prior to that night, I had embarked on a new exciting journey to self-fulfillment as a transgendered man. After months of injecting myself every other week with massive doses of testosterone, chopping off my hair to nearly a buzz cut, and now wearing chest binders, I was hardly looking like their beautiful little girl. I can't recall the majority of the conversation that night. I couldn't tell you what food I ordered or whether it was burned or bland or cooked to perfection. But this night I was about to be exposed, and my parents' entire world was about to come crashing down like a fallen chandelier, shattered into a million unrecognizable pieces. We, we meandered through some dull, small talk for some time, none of us addressing the elephant in the room. Who would crack first? On the outside, I'm calm and collected, but my insides were squirming. Could they seriously have not noticed? After a long while, my dad excused himself to the restroom. My mom, and I, my mom looked at me at some point and asked with a puzzled look on her face, Laura, are you trying to look like a boy? Tears began streaming down my face. I was caught off guard by my own response. I was tough, I thought, and I certainly didn't want to be seen as emotional. I hated being emotional. It was that weak part of me that I was determined to crush at all costs. I'm not sure what it was that made me cry. I didn't honestly care what they thought of me, or at least so I thought at the time. Her response to me, others have since viewed as critical, but as you will see in this story, it was both well-deserved and appropriate. How could you do this to us? She shouted in a whisper. I wasn't sure that was possible, but she didn't need volume in her voice for me to know she was shouting. <laughs> she began to grill me with other questions. I could feel the anger boiling inside of me as I felt I had to defend who I truly was to this Bible thumper that kept her thumb, on, her thumb on me, even though I was now an adult at almost 25 years old. She asked, are you in a relationship with Tasha? I shook my head no. Tasha had been my best friend for years. 
Unbeknownst to my mom, I had actually tried to seduce her into a relationship several months earlier, despite the fact that she'd been in a relationship with the same man for many years. I, I think I saw him as competition. If I could have won her, it would have solidified me as a man. But the truth was, I wasn't attracted to girls. I wanted to be desperately, but I was attracted to men. Yet I was convinced that I was a man inside, and I just wanted to be a normal man, even if that meant having a girlfriend. I wanted to be permanently, I wanted to permanently eradicate all memory of ever having been female. I was ashamed of being female. But no, I was not in a relationship with Tasha. I was in a relationship with Jackie. Um, Jackie was the perfect match for me because she was actually Steve. Um, we were both transgender, but oppositely. Um, he was born a man, and this allowed us to live as a heterosexual couple. We were born oppositely sex naturally, and now we were living as transgender oppositely. Um, although I didn't mention that at, the mo at that moment that Jackie and, or I were transgender, either one, when I finally admitted that I was in a relationship with Jackie, the expression of horror now painted across my mother's face only fueled the bitter anger rising in me. She asked me how I knew her, as she had never heard me mention her before. Well, I thought to myself, that's because you don't know where I've been going and who I've been hanging out with for the last eight months. Again, I'd been hiding that aspect of my life entirely. I had met Jackie at the Equality Center where I'd been attending support group meetings. These meetings, however, were much more than an emotional support group. It was there that I had discovered that being transgender was actually possible, which I've learned now is not, but they tell you it is. <laughs> and, um, and I'd learned of the process I would need to follow to become a man. At that time, in late 2007, transgender was still very much in the shadows, a taboo subject only spoken of in LGBT circles. It wasn't until a few years later it would be a public topic. So the cat was out of the bag that I was in a relationship with another woman, and I wasn't about to admit that Jackie was really a man. That would have been admitting that I was gay in my mind, and I, um, I would have defended that to the death. I was not gay. I was a normal heterosexual man with a girlfriend. Um, Mom looked at me with a demanding intensity I hadn't seen since my teen years when I was still living under their roof. When we get back to your apartment, you are going to tell your dad, she commanded. I shook my head no. She said, oh, yes, you are, she snapped. Somehow we collected our disposition as my dad returned to the table and we were able to fin finish our dinner peacefully. So, per the usual custom, they followed me home to my apartment after dinner to chat for a little while before heading home approximately an hour away. This time was certainly going to be different, I feared. I was hoping she would let it go. I pretended nothing had happened and again made small talk, hoping they would leave. They didn't know how much I wanted them to leave anyway, even on a good night. Did they have any idea how, how much work I had to do before they came over to hide the life that I was really living? It was an inconvenience to the life that revolved entirely around me and my happiness. So as we were sitting on a couch that they had recently purchased for me, in a condo that they had rented for me, my mom looked at my dad and said, Laura has something she'd like to tell you. Again, I shook my head. <laughs> she said, you are going to tell your dad. Tears now streaming down my face, I blurted it all out, even the part my mom hadn't heard yet. It was time to face the music. I mustered up all the energy I had. To them, this was the worst news they'd ever heard. To me, it was everything I'd hoped for my whole life. The extreme opposition of our viewpoints was colliding head on as I began. Ever since I was little, I have felt like I should have been a boy. I don't think they comprehended exactly what I meant by this at first. But as I continued my emotional rambling, I eventually made it around to the fact that I was now transitioning to become a man. My dad's response infuriated me. I changed your diapers when you were a baby. I know you're a girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, he couldn't have known how, much, how angry that made me. He, um, he couldn't know how much I hated being a woman. I couldn't face the fact anymore that I'd been born a girl. And he didn't understand that transgender meant born in the wrong body. I was aware of the fact that I'd been born female, but I was now determined to change it. They demanded I renounce all this nonsense and submit to Christian counseling. My anger boiled over, my emotions flooding out of my ears like steam out of a locomotive. I was so angry that they would deny who I really was inside. Why couldn't they just be happy for me? The LGBT community told me how much they loved me and how wonderful and courageous I was. Why could my own parents not love me too? I now began to see their love as conditional, based on my willingness to obey their rules. But this was my defining moment. The line in the sand had been drawn, and I was not about to give in. But this is the story of how God, of how God redeemed a wretch like me and brought this prodigal child home. 
And so that was my mindset at that time. That's when I really came out to my parents. And, um, but I want you to hear a little bit of the background, and my mom's going to tell you a little bit, uh, just a few minutes about her story. I was born again when I was eight years old, and I was baptized, and I still remember the conviction of the Holy Spirit that night that it fell on me, and I knew that I need to ask Jesus Christ into my life. And I was, of, I was a firstborn female, type A personality. Now, see, you already know a whole lot about me. <laughs> now, what was my mindset in being a good little Christian girl? And this is back in the early 50s. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to memorize scripture. I'm going to make sure I'm in church all the time. And I, then when Bible drill and those things came along, I was right there. And my attitude was always, I can do this. You know, I can do this. And so I had very good external behavior. I was even known in school. Francine doesn't cuss, she doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke, and she doesn't dance. So I, could, I had a checklist, and I could keep all of this checklist. And so it, it became part of my, uh, my philosophy that as a Christian, I could do all these right things. I would be busy, busy working for God. I can do it. And when my report card come, came out, I would have an A. You know, that was always important that I get an A. And my, my philosophy in life was anytime anything came up, I have a plan. I always had a plan. In fact, one of Laura's favorite stories, she loves to tell this on me, it was New Year's Day of 2002. And so she is about 20 years old at this time, and she was on a mission trip in Thailand. She woke me up at 6 o'clock on New Year's Day morning, and she said, Mom, she said, I have had a grand mal seizure, and she's halfway around the world. She said, I've been in the hospital, but I'm out now, and really, I am okay. The first thing out of my mouth, here's what we're going to do. Step one, step two, step three. And she will tell you, it just... It, uh, Surprised her, maybe it didn't surprise her. I didn't even ask how she was. Or I'm sorry this happened. And boy, I, I hate to admit that, but I was always in a mindset of we have to take care of everything. So most of my young adult life, and even extending into some of my adult life, I began in my own strength. I am going to work for God. I am going to serve God. I'm at, down at the church all the time. I teach, and I play the piano, and I was involved in, as a chaperone for the youth going on all the trips, and I'm trying really hard to serve God. And that was my attitude for many years. And I was that type A hamster on that performance wheel, just busy, busy, busy as much as I could be. And I thought my spirituality was related to how busy I am and working for God. And that's how I saw it. But what was going on with me? Oh, that religious flesh would rise up in the pride in me, in my own strength. But yet, as I'm serving God down at this church for years, what am I dealing with? Being judgmental, having a critical spirit, experiencing burnout, working with uh, being impatient, working with being intolerant, and working around jealousy and envy, all those different things. Well, that's the works of the flesh coming out of me even though I was in church serving God. So what happened? I would feel guilty and condemned then. And Satan would agree with me, and sitting right here, he would say, you can't live this Christian life, but all those other people down at the church can. But you can't. But the heart's desire was to be like Jesus. I truly desired that. But the flesh in me would rise up and say, I know what, I'm just going to try harder. That's what the flesh will tell you. I've just got to try harder. Can I be on another committee? No, I'm done. <laughs> so the night she's talking about was July 19th of 2008. It was my 40th wedding anniversary. We decided we would go to Tulsa and have an evening with Laura. And upon her announcement, I was, it was a turning point in my life because I was now in a pit of despair. I had no plan, and this was something I couldn't fix. And I was desperate. And so that night, 
I cried out to God, and I just yielded to him an absolute surrender. I said, I'm coming to you. And he said, finally, because now I can start working in you for you to be the Christian that I want you to be. And it, I've developed into a thriving, growing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that um, hopefully gives you a little bit of insight into some of my feelings as a child. Um, I think we're very much related to everything she was going through, and I can understand that now as an adult, um, but I didn't as a child. And I often see myself, I have on the screen the story of Hosea. When I first came home, um, I just wept all the way through the book of Hosea because I saw myself very much in the eyes of Gomer. Um, that was this, um, this wife of of Hosea but was always out seeking other lovers just didn't didn't want to be married didn't want to be um didn't want to be his wife and um so I've I've identified that very much but it was really in uh, what may seem like an odd book but it was really the book of Hosea that really revealed the heart of God to me and I just saw his unfailing love and the long-suffering patience of God <clears throat> So I was raised in what looked like a perfect environment. Um, we were kind of the all-American family, and um, we were down at the church. We were involved in every program the church offered. You know, I was in Bible drill and mission friends and all these different things. And, uh, but I didn't really understand as a child that I needed a relationship with Jesus. <clears throat> I, um, I very much just thought it was um, God has this rule book, and you are going to obey God's rules, and you are a Christian and uh, you just need to serve God and all these kind of things. So I didn't really understand the relationship aspect of it, and I didn't really want to serve God. Um, but I began when I was about eight years old. <clears throat> um, I was hiding a very dark secret. I had been molested by a, um, one of my friend's brothers, and he was only nine. He was only a year older than me. Um, but it really changed me. And some people have, um, I think, uh, lessened the the severity maybe be, because it only happened once and you know I know people have been through it for years um, of abuse and I can't even imagine but for me it really changed me I became so sexually addicted at a very very young age um, trying to seduce my friends um, and into various sexual acts and I really became a different person but I was hiding this I didn't tell a single soul um, it accidentally slipped out once in college, but I don't think this person understood what I was really saying. I really didn't tell anyone until I told my mom about three or four years ago. Um, so I spent, but I spent much of my life, I began fantasizing about being a boy. And this was actually for various reasons. Um, and I think a lot of it started early in childhood when my mom would, um, she was always so tired I think from working so much at the church she was exhausted like you heard trying to be the perfect Christian and I was um, rowdy and rambunctious I was full of energy I was kind of loud and I was hyper and I would come around and it was always like just go away just get off me leave me alone <laughs> and I just felt like I annoyed my mom so much she used to tell me that I was annoying and I just felt really unloved by my mom but I couldn't see it as a personality difference um, she uh, reacted very differently to my brother who was quiet and obedient <laughs> but I really thought it was because my brother was a boy and I think part of that was my mom lost two boys between me and my brother and I used to think well maybe mom wishes one of my brothers was still alive instead of me because I knew um, they had wanted three kids if one of my brothers had lived I probably wouldn't be here and so I really wrestled with that as a, as a young kid I used to fantasize about being a boy and about being my brother um, and I, when I started having female problems when I was about um, 14, well, actually, one of the reasons that I hated being a girl so much, um, me starting my female cycles was extremely traumatic. Um, it happened publicly. I was actually at a Bible drill competition wearing khaki shorts when I started my period. And um, it was so traumatic to me. And I began to really hate the female body. And um, I just... Um, began, but I began having female problems and it really never worked correctly and so that every little thing like that began to feed this fact well maybe I really should have been a boy um, because I would only have cycles once in a great while 
And my mom, of course, is wanting to fix everything like you are. She's a fixer. And so she had me running to doctor after doctor after doctor for years, going through all these tests. I remember I had a doctor that told me I was going to have a hard time getting pregnant, and I thought, um, well, I'm just not meant to be a girl. And so there was this, there began this tension with mom of um, she claims to love me and she's doing all these things for me, but she's doing things I am begging her not to do. I pleaded with her, please don't make me go to these doctors, please. And it was embarrassing. It's humiliating as a 12, 13, 14-year-old girl to go tell all these doctors about these private things um, and trying to fix this system I didn't want working in the first place. And so mom and I just, it it became like a war. And um, I remember screaming at my mom, just coming in hinged with anger. Um, And I remember at one point just just almost feeling like a hood would come over me. I was so angry I couldn't even see straight. Um, And so the tensions with mom were really boiling over. In the meantime, I was getting extremely sexually active. um, And I, I was struggling because I was really attracted to men Um, even though I was feeling like a boy, and that was always uh, such a weird thing for me. But I was continually getting dumped. I was, uh, so many guys had broken up with me, and I'm like, I'm giving them everything they want, and yet they're still dumping me over and over and over and over. And um, so I began to be very jealous of boys because I really felt like they had all the power. Um, They were the ones controlling the relationship, and so that sort of fed, again, this fantasy of I was meant to be a man. And I was tired of being left. Um, became so angry at mom, and now I was getting more angry with God. Um, I was angry at God for making me a girl. I was, um, and I just, uh, at one point, when I was about 16 years old, I told God that I would never serve him again. I walked away from the faith. I tried really hard to be an atheist, actually, but I couldn't convince myself that there was no God. I knew there was a God, and I knew um, the Bible was true even. But... Um, I just told God that I was never going to serve him again. I ran as far as I could away from God. And uh, when I got into college, I really had no interest in church and um, didn't want— I I was acting like a good Christian at this point. My parents had put me in a group home a couple years earlier and kind of forced me to, you're going to live this Christian life. And so at this point, I had been going to church for a while when I was living at home, but I moved to college. I'd had this guy that was um, kind of courting me. I— Um, for almost two years we were sort of um, seeing each other but never dating because he kept he kept talking about how he wanted more of a courting and um, I eventually kind of gave up on him and um, I was getting it was really God's mercy on him I really um, crushed his heart I think um, because he really was planning on marrying me I didn't realize that at the time Um, but I think it was God's mercy on him because God knew that I was not the Christian girl that he thought I was Um, and then um, I became extremely addicted to sex and pornography and um, I began and this is kind of a dark secret that a lot of women um, don't talk about they say the numbers are almost 40% now of women that are addicted to pornography and um, it's um, it's very prevalent and it will lead to such dark places it always starts with something Um, that seems a little more innocent, but it is a dark, dark road that always leads down. And I'm so ashamed of the things that I ended up watching years later, but I was um, going and meeting random men online and uh, just having all kinds of sexual encounters and just trying so hard to fulfill that void in me. Um, And then in 2007, when um, about a year before we moved home, actually it was uh, December of 2006, sorry, um, and uh, we were driving home. I was moving home from Texas, and we were uh, driving at night with a pouring rain on the road. I mean, to the point there was standing water on the road, so a very, very heavy rainstorm. We were sideswiped by a semi, and all of a sudden, sent spinning all over the median into oncoming traffic with a semi headed toward us. And I remember looking at those lights as they're headed right for my car. And I, um, I remember I was filled with terror that I can't even describe, not just fear, but an absolute terror that I was getting ready to go to hell, and knowing that I was getting ready to look Satan in the face. And it was, I, I, again, I can't even describe that kind of terror that I felt that night, absolutely hysterical with fear, um, but God spared us, 
But what amazes me is even at that moment that you would think, surely this is the moment that that will turn me around. My heart was so hard and I was so determined to live the life that I wanted that it still didn't turn me around, but I never forgot it. Um, so about a year, um, I think it was about a year later, um, it was actually the, the night of the ice storm in Tulsa. I don't know if anybody remembers, I don't remember how bad it was here in Bartlesville, but in Tulsa, 75% of the city was out of power. It was a major, major ice storm. And uh, that was the night, the night it started was the night that I came out to my best friend. And so it was kind of like an omen as ice is raining down on the city and uh, we're driving to a bar that we were going to and there's transformers blowing all over. We didn't realize what it was. We're like, are there fireworks? <laughs> I didn't realize that these were the transformers blowing as people are losing power. Um, so that was in, so in the fall of 2007, I began my transition to become a man. Um, and I thought, I'm free to be who I really am. I'm going to all these pride events, and I'm, uh, this is great, you know, and there's this loving community that tells me how wonderful I am, and, um, but, and I began taking hormone shots. I began to look more male. I had a deeper voice. I was beginning to grow facial hair, and um, just was, all this was really exciting at first, and, uh, but there was an unlikely turning point. Uh, my mom you know, I'm sure this was one of the most devastating events. Aside from the night that I originally told them, this was probably the other really devastating event to them when I told them that I was um, going to be going to live with, um, with Jackie. And um, who, of course, like I said earlier, I, I get confused with the name sometimes because I've known him as uh, Steve for a long time now. Um, but this was Jackie at the time. And um, I was going to go be going to live with him. And... I looked at my Bible, I remember, as I was moving out, and I really looked at it for a moment, and I thought, do I need to keep this? And uh, it had been sitting on my shelf for years, and I had moved it with me every time I'd moved, but now I looked at it, and I, oops, sorry. <laughs> and I threw it away in the dumpster. And I'll never forget that moment of just thinking, this just has no value to me. Um... And one thing in the LGBT community, though, um, they were 99% of it is radically liberal. Um, and what was odd to me about Steve is it reminded me of um, that old commercial where you see all these gray people going one way, and all of a sudden you see this blue one going the opposite direction. And he was like that to me. He was not only conservative, he was radically conservative. And he was so far against their political views. And it, it's not even so much about politics as it was. I was so interested to know why he could stand against the grain, why he was so concerned with what was really true and not just going along with everybody else. Because that's what I had always done. And so it really began um, to make me question what the truth was. What did I really believe? And not just what does everybody else say. So even though this is... Um, to my parents looks like an absolute tragedy that I'm now living um, with a girlfriend um, really became a moment where God was beginning to change me and God actually used Steve quite a bit in my life um, just a very unlikely source but we were going one of the first things we were going to these support group meetings and we noticed that the we were leaving these support group meetings more depressed than when we got there and um, we're like man what is going on these are the most depressed people in the world and we really thought it was just those particular people. Those people just haven't figured it out. And we were really cocky in the fact that we're like, we just know how to live this better. We're not caught up in all this LGBT community. We're just, we're just out there living normal lives. I'm just a normal man going to work and all this. And um, so we really didn't make the connection that it's because the transgender life will leave, lead to depression. Um, but we didn't realize that at the time. And so we quit going to the meetings. We pulled out of the LGBT community entirely. And so that was another thing that it was God's mercy. And it was really Steve that saw that. And so I'm really grateful that God used him in that way to get me out of the community. And I tried really hard to be involved with my family. Uh, tried going on vacations and different things, but I was never comfortable. I didn't want to admit it. I told him that I was comfortable being this new person, but I really wasn't. I didn't like being around my family because I knew, I think I knew it was a lie and it was just, there was always so much discomfort, and I just wanted to go home. Um, but in 2009, I had um, went to San Francisco to have an outpatient double mastectomy. Um, 
And I know that this event was another one that just absolutely crushed my parents. Um, and some dear friends took them over to their house and just kind of loved on them and, um, oops, um, prayed with them. But they didn't know that this was another big moment in my life, just another way that God began to work on me. And so I'm always reminded of the many ways that God turned what was so evil into his good because that was the first time in many, many years that I had started to pray. I was so afraid. I didn't want to admit it, but I was so scared I would not wake up from that surgery. And I prayed, and I said, God, please don't let me die. And so at that moment, not that everything turned around right then, I didn't repent of all my sin and all that, but at that moment, I would genuinely beg God to spare my life. And so after the surgery, at first I was like, this is awesome. I have a man's chest. I am so excited, and I love the results, and um, I'm just, I'm going to embark on this new identity, and it's all going to be wonderful. Um, but I was really surprised. About four weeks later, I went to my, um, went back to work, and my boss, after a while, um, was really mad at me, and she came to me one day, and she said, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I want the old Jake back. She said, you're not working as hard, you're um, unmotivated, you're depressed. What is wrong with you? And I couldn't admit it. I, told, I don't remember, just kind of made something up and she dropped it. Oh, and I got to tell you too, this boss was not against what I was doing. She was a lesbian. She was very pro-transgender, uh, thought all of this was wonderful. Um, but inside, what I was really thinking is, my surgery didn't make me a man. It changed my physical appearance, but that's all. Um, and so I became very, very depressed. I was now legally male. I was legally named Jake. Um, I was known only as a man. I began to pass very well out in public and be perceived as a man. I thought I had everything I had ever wanted. And yet it was all, I began to realize it was all a lie. I couldn't be a man. And I knew that no surgery was going um, was gonna to fix that. Because all I was doing was changing the outer appearance. So in this way, Satan had revealed his hand to me. I think sometimes Satan can't help but gloat. Um, and I just remember thinking, this has all been a lie. I've been deceived. But, you know, this is still just life. This is still the same thing. just still going to work and um, doing all these things, but I'm no happier. I don't really have this new identity. I have this new thing I'm calling myself, but I, I'm not any different. Uh, the excitement had worn off. I was no longer happy. I was sick of the fakeness. Um, but I wanted to erase the existence of Laura. I didn't want to be a girl. I was so angry about being a girl. And so I decided, well, I'm kind of stuck this way, and I'm, I'm going to live the best appearance of a male that I can. But what I'd promised to be freedom had now become my prison cell. And I didn't know then, but there was an army praying for me many ladies that were here in this Bible study faithfully praying for me and many others in the church. And God began to drop what, what I describe as an unexpected breadcrumb trail. Um, and uh, one of the very first things I was, uh, this was for my birthday, I'd, you can't see the CDs in the picture, but I was given some CDs of some music that I'd been listening to of uh, Godsmack, Metallica. Awful, awful um, music that um, I should not have been listening to. And all of a sudden one day, I'm driving down the road, and for no reason I can explain to a single soul, I had the desire to turn on Christian music and just out of the blue turn on KXOJ. Um, and so, and then after that, a short time later, I had this dream about the rapture. My dad had been telling me about prophecy all the time. And it was interesting because, you know how in dreams, th things aren't always... Um, like literally the same even though you know what it's talking about because in this dream we were going in the rapture one at a time and uh, even though I know that's not um, correct that's what was in my dream and the reason was as we're all stepping up and one by one he's taking these people he got to me and he put his hand out and he said it's not your time yet and that really scared us in the interview like five minutes I think ten minutes maybe and I thought well there's no way I'm going to get that but sure enough they called and they wanted to hire me and um, it was just a temp position at the time, but it was a uh, temp to hire. And um, for various reasons, they, I had been not trained very well by the job. My boss was actually on vacation during the job. 
or when I first started, and I wasn't trained very well, but I didn't realize that, and so I wasn't um, doing quite what she wanted, and nobody ever told me this, and so she kept telling the temp agency that out of everybody, she was the last one I would hire if they ever decided to hire one, but I kept working, I kept plugging away, and um, eventually um, kind of figured all this out, and um, after about a year, I was the one that got hired, and I knew that God had provided this job for me, and my boss was a Christian, and we ended up having conversations later, and I uh, was very grateful to her um, for sharing her faith with me. And I had everything I thought I, um, that I'd ever dreamed of. I had a wife at the time, a great job. I was perceived as a man, and yet I was so empty inside. Um, and I remember I was listening to the radio one day, and I was listening to this particular talk show host that was very um, libertarian. He was not um, anti-LGBT in any sense, um, but just out of the blue one day, he said, why is it that transgenders always want to change their body to match their mind and not change their mind to match their body? And I was really stunned by that question. And I thought, um, I was really angry at it at first. I was like, man, if he was here, I would give him a piece of my mind, you know, and he just doesn't understand how it is. And I thought, you know, but I really can't answer that question. Why, why is it that I have to change my body to match my mind and not try to change the mind to match the body? Um, so that question really haunted me, and I played it over and over and over in my head. And so that's my encouragement a lot of times. If you don't have a lot of time to really talk to somebody, sometimes questions and making people think about what they really believe uh, can be really powerful. Um, but a little while later, Mom had asked me to make a website for her Bible study. And uh, I thought, sure, you know, I'll, I was a programmer, and I really wasn't interested in Bible study at the time. But I was going to do this for mom because I really needed the money. She was going to pay me. And I needed the experience for my portfolio. And, uh, but as I'm uh, beginning to look at her notes to make a summary for each lesson, um, which mom didn't even ask me to do, by the way. I was just supposed to put the, the audio clips on there. But the Lord had prompted me, I think, to, um, to make a little summary for each lesson. So I had to actually go read the notes and try and pull out little bits. And as I did, I began to see something very different from what I remembered as a child. Now I wasn't just hearing about all these rules that God had. I was beginning to see love in the Bible. And one of the things I remember so clearly was when mom was talking about how Joseph was a type of Jesus. And this just blew my mind because I've always heard of this angry, judgmental God. And then all of a sudden this loving Savior comes years later and it never made sense to me. And so I'm like, what do you mean? I have to understand. So Remember, at this point, I have not called my mom other than we talked occasionally, but we rarely spoke. Um, I did not call her just because I wanted to talk to her. Mainly, I called her if I felt obligated for a birthday or something. Um, but I really had not been interested in talking to her. So now, all of a sudden, I said, you've got to tell me more. And um, I started calling and talking to her nearly every day. Um, and I s just talking about the Word and what she was learning. And I said, Mom, what has happened to me? I'm 180 degrees from where I was a few months ago. I said, all I can think about is the Bible and what God has revealed in his word. And she said, I've been praying that God would draw you back like a magnet. And that's exactly what he had done. And he was drawing me back. Um, and so something was happening. This was the mother, and I'm only using the pictures of age difference here to illustrate um, but just remembering this a angry, judgmental, critical mother um, that would always tell me how much she loved me, and she was doing lots for me. Looking back, my mom sacrificed herself for me, doing so much, but never just making me feel like she wanted me around. And never, you know, it was never, I never saw that faith in her. I saw a lot of religion. But all of a sudden, something had changed. And my mom was not the person that she was. And I think it's at that moment that I knew the gospel was true because I knew it in my head at that point. But I knew at that moment when I noticed the change in my mom, I knew it was true. And so I'm <clears throat> wrestling with this in my head and I'm thinking of this old mom that I knew growing up and yet I'm hearing this new mom. And um, I began wrestling with this and I began asking the Lord, God, I want to be used by you again. And I had um, prayed a little prayer one night and asked the Lord into my heart, you know, but I just, I felt like such damaged goods. 
I thought, Lord, I have spit in your face for so long. Not only have I sinned, but I said I would never serve you again. And so I was riding down a glass elevator at, at work so I could look out over the city. And uh, I'm looking across the street, and I, I said, God, where do I start? And he said, start with them. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. There was a couple walking across the street that I was just looking at at that moment. And I was terrified. I was like, what do you mean? Like, first of all, I didn't expect God to actually answer. I, <laughs> I really thought that, um, you know, I meant like in the distant future, like maybe he'll call me to be a missionary or something. <laughs> I didn't mean at that moment. Um, but God said, start with them. And so I was like, what do you mean? I, I didn't have any clue what he meant. So I went outside and I'm peeking around the building, and um, they walked over to this bus stop, and I was like, see, they're, they're going to get on the bus, they're going to leave, and I don't have time to go over there anyway. I'm going to make them late. Um, and, you know, they're not leaving, the bus didn't come, and I went out back into the building and back out three or four times, and there was this elephant sitting on my chest, and I'm like, I can't even breathe. I have to go talk to these people. I had no idea what I was going to say, and... Um, and eventually I was like, where is this bus? This is the longest bus in history. No bus should take this long to get there. And so eventually I just couldn't stand anymore. I walked over and I had no idea what I was going to say. And I just uh, felt like I had to obey God. This was so clearly God asking me to do this. And uh, I walked over to him and the Lord literally fed me about one word at a time. And I said, I never do this, but I feel like God wants me to pray with you. <laughs> I said, is there anything I can pray with you about? And tears started streaming down their faces, and they said they had just moved to town. They had no job. They had no money. They had no cars. They didn't know anybody. I mean, I was just stunned, and so I started praying with them, and I remember I, the Holy Spirit came over me so powerfully I couldn't stand up straight. I was swaying back and forth. I thought, these people are going to think I'm absolutely crazy. Um, and that was it. You know, I just, I prayed with them. Uh, I gave them a few dollars for the bus that I had on me, but, um, but that moment transformed my life because that moment, it was like everything inside became alive. That is when I know that I'd became a, I had become a new creation because for the first time, it wasn't all up here in the head. I had truly trusted God, and I trusted Christ, and I remember all of a sudden, I remember feeling like light was bursting forth from me, and all, my mind was flooded with hymns and all the scripture I'd heard as a child and all these things, and I just was a radically transformed person uh, that whole day, just wanted nothing but to fill myself with the praise of the Lord. And so I was truly saved, and this was in about 2014. Um, like I said, I was so radically different after that. I started growing. I was sharing my faith with my coworkers, um, and, uh, but I wanted to be a man of God. And um, I was not ready to give up that transgender life yet. And the Lord really was so patient with me. He grew my faith first, but he didn't leave me there. It's not that, okay, that God was okay with it, but he was patient, and he began to grow me. And I was so consumed with learning about God. I would listen all day long while I was at work. I was listening to some kind of Bible teaching, um, audio Bible, um, Christian talk radio, whatever it was, anything I could um, fill myself with the Word of God. And God really began to reveal the insanity of the transgender movement at this time. And I remember hearing about the bathroom bills, and I was like, okay, even I recognize that it is insane to let a grown man go in the bathroom with little girls just because he says he's a, uh, a woman. You know, I had worked really hard to do this legally and because um, I was using men's restrooms, but even at that point with me using men's restrooms, I signed the Target pledge months before I moved home. And I always think that's kind of funny, but... Um, even I could recognize that insanity. <clears throat> so, but I wanted to bring up, there were some other things that we began to see on TV that we realized was really insane. There, um, there are people that call themselves transracial. I remember if you heard about their, her, this lady worked for the NAACP and was actually fairly high up in the organization and everybody thought she was black. She was actually born a white girl. Um, I mean, she's still white. She just colored her skin. Um, and then there is what is called trans species. These people are serious. This one, the one that looks like a serpent there, has had all kinds of surgeries and mo body modifications, has spent, last I saw, was about $65,000. And this is not just a, 
<coughs> a fad. These people really believe this, um, and they will spend tons of money. Um, and then transageism. This one's really scary because I think um, pedophiles are going to be getting into this. This is, this is a grown 50, I think at the time this was made, which was several years ago, this was a 54-year-old man claiming to be a 6-year-old girl, and a family with their own daughter actually took him in and is raising him as their daughter, and um, it is a frightening, frightening thing. Um, but at the time I was listening to um, the Pat Campbell show out of um, Tulsa, and I had been listening to him for years, and all of a sudden he started having on this guest that was um, named Dr. Everett Piper, and I was instantly a fan. I loved listening to him and was so excited. Um, and he just, I don't know, he just spoke in a way that really spoke to me. Um, and I was so interested to hear him talk. I was so drawn to this show that I had to make sure I was in the car every Friday morning at 7 o'clock um, to make sure I didn't miss his show because um, it was, and it was only on that once a week. He was just a guest on this show. Um, but it became my most favorite thing to listen to all week. I'd look forward to it. And at first, he never touched the transgender issue. And all of a sudden, one day, he starts talking about transgenders, and my ears immediately just close off. And I'm like, oh, I wish he wouldn't talk about that. But I was such a fan, and I remember reasoning this out in my head and thinking, well, I've been a big fan of his for a long time, and, you know, he just doesn't understand. So he'll be on to a new topic next week. I'm not going to worry about it. And so I just really pretended like he'd never even said it. And uh, I thought, well, um, I'm just going to forget about it. But the next week, he was talking about the same thing. And the next week, and the next week, and the next week. And all of a sudden, he is banging the same drum every week, talking about transgenders. And I'm like, God, what is going on? And I finally began to listen. And he wasn't being hateful. What he was saying was that I was made in the image of God, and that I had, um, if I was just made up of feelings and instincts and in intuitions, that would just make me like an animal. But I'm made in the image of God, and I can choose my behavior. And that was such a radical thought to me, and one I didn't want to hear, because I wanted to believe the lie that I had to follow my feelings. Um, but he was the, it really began to transform my thinking. I knew he was right, and I didn't want to admit it. Um, but I'm eternally grateful to Dr. Piper for changing my thinking on that. But I know, and I got to a point where I no longer wanted to be transgender. But the problem was, I didn't want to be a girl. I felt so caught between. I wanted so desperately to just be a man. I tried to pretend like I'd always been born that way. I tried to convince myself that there was just some um, genetic anomaly that had happened um, because I couldn't be transgender, but I couldn't be a, a girl either. So my dad starts meeting me every week in Tulsa, and he starts telling me about the rapture and all these end time things. And um, so I'm like, yeah, getting all excited. I'm going to go meet Jesus, you know. And I'm picturing myself standing before the Lord. And, the, and then um, I asked mom what she happened to be teaching at the time. Well, mom was teaching about the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, I'm not ready for that. I, it was much more exciting to think about going to heaven, you know, and just we're going to have a great time and. I had never really thought about standing before Christ and, like, um, him judging my life and what I had done with my life. And so I really began to consider it. And so as I'm thinking that night, um, the Lord spoke so clearly to me and said, if he stood before me tonight, what name would I call? And I was really stunned by that question. I knew that the Lord was not going to call me Jake. Um, and it's not that the Lord... Um, I, I knew that God... It wasn't like he didn't know who I was. Um, you know, it reminds me a bit of Adam in the garden when he asked Adam where he was. God knew where Adam was, but he wanted Adam to know where he was. And so I think in this case, God was um, asking me, who uh, was I going to identify as? Who, what was my true identity? And he led me to John 1, where it talks about Jesus being the creator. And he said, you cannot claim to love me and hate my creation. And so then he led me to um, Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. 
For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I begin to really loathe being transgender. I was sick of the hormone injections, clothes that never fit, I was, and the prosthetics and all these other things. Sick of covering the lies. I was sick of hiding. Um, I did not want to be a girl. And I was convinced I was supposed to be a man. But I heard this preacher out of, out of England. I was watching these YouTube videos on end times. And this was the moment I just was uh, really convicted. He said, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. And God said, You have got to get out of this. And so I felt like I'd been hit in the chest with a sledgehammer. All of a sudden, I was in this deep, dark pit that I couldn't get out of. And I remember I begged God for about the next month. The Lord left me there and um, just let me cry out to him. And I cried, and I said, God, please take my life. I begged God to just let me die because I did not want to be transgender anymore with everything that was in me. But I was not ready to accept being a girl. And uh, I said, God, I'm willing to leave it, but I don't know how. What am I supposed to do? They only know me as a man at work. What am I supposed to just show up in a dress and say, just kidding, I'm really a girl. <laughs> I'd known these people for years. And other than my family and Steve, nobody really knew that I was a girl. And, um, but I remember so clearly, I had this vision of Jesus getting down on one knee and reaching into the pit and he said, do you trust me? And I remember thinking at that moment, he's asking me to leave everything and walk away without knowing how it's all going to turn out. But I was desperate. And I said, I'm willing. And so I did. And I cannot explain to a single soul on this earth how I got through the next three weeks. I stayed and finished out my job um, and packed everything up. I gave away all my possessions and packed away my life. And I cannot explain it other than he carried me home. And so for three days and three nights, I really felt completely dead. I never experienced that kind of sorrow and anguish of soul. I wept and wept and wept. And I remember it was, I was so overwhelmed. I actually came home on a Sunday and um, came to church. And I sobbed the entire way through the service. I sobbed the entire um, way through lunch and Sunday school and I was just so overcome with grief and I just thought I've made a mistake I can't do this so I went back to my apartment that afternoon I made some excuse I had a few things left I had to get and I remember Steve opened the door and he hugged me and I felt like I was in the arms of a stranger and I was like oh, this is so weird and um, I was sitting in our apartment that I'd lived in for almost eight years and um I felt like I was in a hotel room. And I said, God, what is going on? And the Lord said, I have cut the cord on your old life, and you are not going back. And so I knew I had to go home, no matter what it cost me. And I was ready just to come home and be miserable the rest of my life, because I knew I couldn't stay where I was. And the next three days and three nights were some of the most awful night days I've ever had in my life. I would get one shirt out of my bag at a time and cry for an hour. That's all I could do. Um... But then my mom, uh, Tuesday afternoon, set me down and gave me, handed me a stack of cards that the women in this Bible study had written to me, along with a check for almost $1,600 um, to buy a new wardrobe. And I was so overcome. Not, they, just hadn't, they hadn't just bought a card and, and signed it. Most of these women had written real notes to me of encouragement and, um, and all the money they had contributed, and I felt... For the first time, I was like, somebody cares. And the next morning when I showed up at Bible study, it was a little, it wasn't pretty at first. I didn't look much like a girl yet, but I was surrounded by love. And this was, my heart in that moment was truly transformed because in the, for the first time in my love, in my life, I felt loved as a woman and loved by women. And God, um, I think my mom actually said this to me, that um, she believed that God would restore the years that the locust had eaten. And sure enough, he has. He's restored the time with my parents. He's restored my appearance. He's brought people from my past um, that I've been able to share Jesus with. 
um, I now work at this church that I said I would never come back to. <laughs> I didn't plan on stepping foot in this door, and now I'm here most of my life. Um, he has reversed much of the damage that I had done. Um, I've just been amazed at the people he's brought back into my life uh, from my high school years that I've been able to share my testimony with. Um, and um, just various events, like um, I was on a panel at a, a college one time telling people how wonderful transgender was and they needed to accept it and all this. Um, he's given me opportunity to go now and share with college students and share the truth of Jesus Christ. So he has been reversing everything. Um, and these are just some of the various events I've been able to attend. Um, we had a, uh, an event here called Straight Talk um, where we discussed these things, and um, I've spoken at a women's conference. I spoke last year at the JMI Collision Conference at Oakloo. Um, I was able to be a part of the Freedom March in Washington, D.C. This is a, um, a brand new movement that I feel like God is birthing. Um, there are now people, when I first came out, I could only find about two or three other people that had ever left a transgender lifestyle. Now there are hundreds and I'm sure there's many more coming. And, um, and then the Emerging Apologist program that I got to go to this summer, summer with Ravi Zacharias, and, uh, which many of you helped fund, and I'm so grateful. Um, and then um, this Transform documentary. I wasn't in the documentary. It's wonderful, though, if you want to check it out, but I was able to go um, to a screening of it where they had a, a Q&A panel. Um, and then I've had opportunities to share with college students. I've had opportunities to share with our youth group, with various churches, various radio, news articles, and TV interviews. And the Lord has done all of this. People have told me that I need to self-promote, and I need to do this, and I need to do that, and I need to... Um, the Lord has done all of this. I haven't sought these opportunities. Um, and so this has just been a work that God has been doing. Um, but a few things I've learned... Number one, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. This has been a radical transformation that only the Lord could have done. I'm both with my mom waiting and now with me waiting, and I've seen the opportunities that God has brought when I've been patient and have waited on him. Um, there were people that advised, uh, wanted me to come work in their ministry as soon as I left that lifestyle. That was very, very bad advice. I needed the time to come home and heal, and it's been so healing. Um, and just as an encouragement, uh, Joseph waited 13 years, Abraham waited 25 years, Moses 40 years, Jesus waited 30 years. Um, if God's making you wait, you're in good company. <laughs> so sometimes people in, um, seem to almost get disappointed when I'm not out doing as much as I think I should be, and I, I've really, the Lord has told me to wait. Um, so I, I just ask your patience. I'm very much seeking the Lord on where he's leading, um, but the Lord has told me to wait, and he's brought many opportunities in the meantime. Um, number two, uh, God's creation of women is good. If you have, and I did not understand that when I first came home. It really wasn't until about a year later that I did this study. And I'm not big on endorsing books necessarily. I'm very much just uh, reading God's word. Um, but at least know God's word first before you read other people's books because they can lead you astray. But this book is very, very good, and I would highly recommend it to any woman that's not read it. Um, it's called Divine Design, uh, True Woman 101. And um, this book was the first one that really made me understand why God created women. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And so for the first time after doing this study, I was not only accepting being a woman just because that's the way God ordered it, <laughs> but I really began to love being a woman. And so number three, uh, there's really no such thing as transgender. You cannot transition to another gender. It's not possible. Um, all you can do is change the outward appearance. And so I had to learn that the hard way. I have, a, um, I have real consequences that I have to live with every day, even though God has redeemed me. There are still things that I suffer from every day um, for the rest of my life. And so, but you really, um, when people tell you that they are truly transgender and that they are this other identity, they're not. They can't be. Um, and this is a quote from a book that I want to read real quick. Activists tend to be uncompromising in their demands, yet their worldview is fraught with contradictions. It holds that the real self is fundamentally separate from the material body, um, yet insists that transforming the body is crucial for personal wholeness. It attaches a notion of authentic gender, gender identity to stereotypical activities and dispositions, yet it grows from a philosophy holding that gender is an artificial construct. It promotes a radical subjectivity to which individuals should be free to do whatever they wish and to, find the, and to define the truth they choose, yet it calls for enforced conformity of belief in transgender dogma. 
And so there, there's so many contradictions um, in this philosophy. And just like I said uh, that I heard on the radio er, earlier, you know, why is it that transgenders always want to change the body to match the mind? They will tell you that the, bo- um, that the body and mind are separate. You know, the mind is who I really am, and yet they want to change the body to fix that. And so it really doesn't even make sense. And what, what cracks me up is, um, this is just one of my own contradictions that I've noticed, they use fictional characters to describe what they believe is a factual reality. Um, so they have here the gender unicorn, and they have the gender bred person. Um, and so, again, they have to use these artificial things to try and explain all this. Um, number five, keep your eyes on the solution. It is so easy for us to get caught up at looking at the problem in our society of all this rampant LGBT stuff that is just, it's creeping into the church, it's creeping in everywhere. Um, but keep our eyes focused on God. As a, and this is one of my favorite scriptures. O oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against, cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And so that solution, of course, is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Um, and this is another favorite in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. There is hope and there is freedom from all this. And these are just some of the ones that I have met, most of them personally, a few just on Facebook. But there are so many people coming out of these lifestyles. And the media will tell you that these people cannot change, they're born that way, that is a lie from the pit of hell. There is redemption and freedom in Jesus Christ. And I especially wanted this to mention this because the biggest lie in the church right now um, is that um, they, these people are born this way, they can't change, and we just need to love them. They're not really accepting the homosexuality yet. What they're saying is these people are homosexual, but they just need to be celibate. What kind of hope and freedom is that to tell people that you're just stuck with this, God can't fix this, and you're just um, destined to be this way the rest of your life? Give them the hope of Jesus Christ that they can be transformed. And it wasn't instant for me. It took obedience, it took time, it took surrender. But the Lord has transformed my heart, and I've seen it in every one of these individuals, and I've seen them walking in lasting freedom. And so finally, this is my story. Transgender to transformed. There's hope in Jesus Christ to transform every heart. Thank you. Thank you. I give all the credit to the Lord. <laughs> Thank you so much. If um, I wanted to have a, uh, a little bit of a Q&A time. If anybody has any questions, I don't know if we have any, but um, if you do, please feel free. Um, if you need to leave, you're certainly welcome. It's uh, just after 1030, but... Um, if you would like to ask any questions, I'd love to answer. Is there any? No? Okay, that's okay. But you can always, um, on the back of my card is a, um, an email address. Um, please take one. You're welcome to email me if you ever have any questions or if you ever want more information. I'd be glad to help. No questions. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay, Uh, as we close here in just a few minutes, I want to thank all of you for coming and listening to this story of an amazing redemption. It has been amazing and wonderful. And this Bible study, Come Grow With Me, has been a major part in Laura's life. And I want to thank all of you ladies. Many of you have prayed for her for several years. Many of you have been instrumental in encouraging her and uh, she couldn't have come to a better place. And uh, y'all have just Mm -hmm. wrapped her up, and many of you tell me that she is yours. (laughs) So, But I know that she is a lot of hope 
for all of us that have prodigals. Because if God can redeem her and bring her back from the pit she was in, he'll work in all of them. He'll work in every prodigal's heart. So she does uh, exhibit a lot of hope for all of us. Uh, once again, if uh, you're not a regular member of our Come Grow With Me and you would like to be here and become part of our group, there's information out there uh, when you leave. Uh, I'm going to let Laura go on out in the lobby. Some of you may <coughs> want to talk to her when we dismiss. And uh, those of you that want to join us for our special prodigal prayer time, we will be meeting in the room right here. Uh, just go through the exit sign, and we're going to spend... Uh, Oh, 30 to 40 minutes in uh, time of prayer for our prodigals and many of you are welcome that would like to do that with us I uh, forgot to introduce Karen stand up please uh, this is Karen Kinnaird is that right and uh, she is from the BGCO here in the state of Oklahoma and writes for the Baptist Messenger and uh, she was curious about our prodigal basket and our prodigal prayer time and so she drove from Oklahoma City this morning to hear Laura she's going to participate in our prodigal prayer time and then write an article in the Baptist Messenger uh, about our Bible study and so forth so we're honored to have you with us this morning okay and I'm just reminding all of you of the luncheon next week we'd love to have all of you here uh, as we continue our study on the Feast of Pentecost and then uh, we will have lunch together. If there's no questions, wow, that's hard to believe. Okay, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we just thank you for the time that you have uh, allowed us to come together and hear this story of your amazing redemption. And Lord, from the bottom of my heart, we thank you and we praise you for a restored and a redeemed life. And not only did it change her, but the work that it also did in me. And Lord, we just thank you, and all the praise goes to our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank all of you for coming, and if you want to talk...